Hallelujah. I pray that this confession is ours and yours. May we be able to praise the name of the Lord all the day long all, until we reach heaven. And in heaven, we'll be praising him even more. Amen. Let us look forward to that day. Today, uh, the passage that Elder has read, uh, we see Jesus going up to Jerusalem. And on the way up to Jerusalem, Jesus forewarned about his suffering, his death, and resurrection. And this was the third time he forewarned about his suffering and death. And uh, the first prophecy of his suffering and death and resurrection was in Matthew chapter 16, 21 through 28, Mark chapter 8, 31 through 33, and Luke chapter 9, verses 22 through 27. And the second prophecy was Matthew 17, 22 through 23, Mark 9, 30 through 32, Luke chapter 9, verse 43 through 45, all the same. And third, which is today's main passage, Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 through 19, Mark 10, 32 through 34, and Luke chapter 18, 31 through 34. Jesus forewarned very seriously about his death and resurrection, and in detail. And he said, when I go up to Jerusalem, they will arrest me, and I will go through this suffering, and I will die. But on the third day, I will rise again. But the disciples did not understand, nor could they believe it. It was kind of like, oh, Jesus, you always say that. You know, you know imagine uh, walking with and following a young man, about 31, 32 or 33, about 33 years old. And he's, he keeps on talking about dying. Would you believe it? He's talking about, I'm gonna, when I go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. Okay, okay, Jesus. Okay. Well, you, you die, but uh, Jesus is teaching them about the path of the cross, however, about how the path of the cross is about suffering, humility, and sacrifice. But the disciples did not understand the importance. They didn't understand the need or the significance, even the seriousness of what Jesus is talking about at that point. Later, after Jesus' resurrection, after the disciples became apostles, when they were writing the Gospels, they realized this was really, really important. And that's why they wrote it. But in the Gospel of Mark, right after Jesus foretold about this serious suffering and death and resurrection, this is what the disciples come to Jesus and say. Verse 35, Mark chapter 10, verse 35. James and John, the, son, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And then he, they continue on the next verse. Grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. Can you kind of imagine what Jesus must have been feeling like? He's telling them about the suffering and crucifixion about his death. And they come, and they're like, okay, Jesus, you're suffering, okay, that's good, but uh, can you give us, when you come into glory, when you go on that throne, become that king and ruler, can I be your right hand and my brother be your left? Jesus' response to their request, verse 38, he said, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink, up the, drink the cup that I drink? He's talking about the cross. Crucifixion. Jesus says, are you able to drink up the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? He says, are you able to be baptized? Jesus is again speaking about the crucifixion. That is baptism. But they didn't, they didn't even know the significance of the cross. And they said, oh yeah, of course, we'll drink up the cup that you drink, but just give us that position. It was the same way when Jesus was foretelling about this, 
about his suffering the second time. We're going backwards. Today's passage is, a, is the third time Jesus, Jesus prophesied about his suffering three times. Today's passage is the third time. The second time he, they did the same thing. Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 32. From there they went out and began to go, to get, go through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand the statement, and they were afraid to ask him. So again, same thing. They did not understand. Today's passage, it says that they did not understand. Second time, Jesus, uh, back in the second time, they did not understand. And look at what they say, right? what they do right after that. We just read Mark chapter 30, 9, verses 30 through 32, verses 33 through 34, 33 and 34. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, what were you discussing on, the, on your way, on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way, they, they had discussed with one another, one another, which of them was the greatest. Jesus is talking about the crucifixion, how he will die, and they're talking about, hey, I'm greater than you. They're fighting. They're arguing. Their focus is their position both times. Jesus is telling them, I'm going to suffer and die. But to them, it was more like, oh, this teacher, every time he goes to Jerusalem, he says, he's going to die. He's, he's a repertoire. He's always saying that. And when, but when Jesus was foretelling about his suffering the first time in Matthew chapter 16, remember when Apostle Peter, disciple Peter, made his great confession that Jesus is the Son of God. Matthew chapter 16. Right after that, Jesus tells him about the suffering that he will go through. And when he says that, he says, he said, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your own cross. Matthew 16, 24 through 26, I'll read it for you. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus is saying, if you want to live, if you want that blessing of eternal life, follow me. But in order to follow me, you have to take up your own cross. Jesus is saying, what is more important, to save your soul or to gain everything on this earth. Which would you choose if you, had, if you are given the two, two choices? Save your soul or get what you want? And apparently, the disciples did not understand and they were seeking for what they wanted at that moment. We need to ask ourselves, do we have a similar attitude about the cross? Oh, Jesus says, every time he goes up to Jerusalem, he's talking about dying. Again today. So kind of ignore that and, and come back to my agenda. Every year, there's Lent and Passion Week. Every year, a pastor preaches the same thing about the cross. Same thing. How much value does the cross have for you? So today's message is, do you need that cross? The, the title for today's message. Do you need the cross? Which cross? The cross that you will bear. Do you need that cross? Our obvious answer would be, uh, can I pass? What is your cross today? Are you bearing a cross to follow Jesus? Jesus says you have to take up your cross to follow me. What is, are you carrying that cross today? Do you need that cross? 
You might say, yeah, my kids are my cross. My husband, my wife, is my cross. If they are, give thanks to God for them because without the cross, you cannot follow Jesus. But that's not the cross that Jesus is talking about today. But I pray that you and I will take up our cross today and decide to follow Jesus. May you and I be the ones that will follow Jesus all the way to the end, become the spiritual 144,000. There's one person that wants to follow Jesus today. And so Jesus is teaching us about how to take up that cross, meaning how to follow him. And we will learn from the events that took place right before Jesus said this, today's passage, and right after. So what precedes the event? What event precedes this passage, our main, main passage today? It was when Jesus was walking and a young rich ruler comes to Jesus seeking for eternal life. That was, that's what happened before before Jesus talked about his suffering today. And what happens after this? Jesus goes down to Jericho. He heals a blind man, Bar- uh, Bartimaeus. And then he meets Zacchaeus. He calls Zacchaeus. So we are going to think about these two events. Meeting the young ruler, young rich ruler, and calling of Zacchaeus. But before that, let us think about this first. Please forgive me for asking you this question, but have you ever really given a serious thought about going to hell? We always seriously think about going to heaven, but have you ever seriously given a thought or imagination about going to hell? If you die today, or I'm not cursing you, okay? If, let us really think about this individually, if I die today, or if my life ends today, will I be in heaven or hell? Please do not misunderstand me. I'm not trying to give you doubts about your assurance of salvation. We want to have that assurance of salvation. But if we are going to have assurance of salvation, we want to make sure it is the good one, right one. We don't want to hype ourselves or or deceive ourselves or misunderstand because in Matthew chapter 7 Jesus talks about talks to these religious leaders during that time the ones that are guaranteed by in the eyes of the people guaranteed to go to heaven those ones that they themselves thought no doubt about themselves going to heaven and others people thought of course if anyone is to go to heaven It's it's them. Jesus is talking to them. And he says, you will go to heaven, knock on the door, you meet the Lord, and you will say, Lord, I did this in your name. I did this in your name. I did this in your name. The Lord will say, I never knew you. Imagine, if you you would, just for this, this short moment, if you were at that place, And Jesus says, I don't know you. Where do you belong then? As soon as he says, I don't know you, where are you going to be? You don't want me to say the name, the the word, but hell. Right? And what is hell? As we have learned in Sunday school, we we know, the Bible says, it's an eternal place. You will have eternal life in hell. Right now, even if we have pain, suffering, sickness, we can live our life because we have that hope. One day, this suffering will end. But in hell, there's no such hope. Eternally, you will go through that pain. Imagine the, the greatest mental pain or physical pain and both that you have ever experienced. Multiply that by thousands. And you will be experiencing that forever and ever. And just imagine that you don't have any, cho- uh, any more chance. 
Is that good enough to help you seriously think about going to hell? Now, what would you do to avoid that? What is there that you can do? Or what would you do? To what extent would you do things to make sure that you enter into the kingdom of heaven? That's what Jesus is talking about. Taking up the cross. Now, let me ask you the question again. Do you need the cross? I think there is a little bit more than one person this time. What we need is the cross. We need to walk the path of the cross in order to follow Jesus. The cross is the only thing that will turn us away from the path to hell to the path towards the kingdom of heaven. So let us think about these two people, the young rich ruler in Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 23. A ruler questioned him saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Let's think about this young ruler. Let's put away our fixed thoughts and our answers. But he had good faith. He was young, good faith, a lot of money. It says extremely rich. Good respected position in the society, very good job. That means he had good education background, good credentials, good experience, and kept the commandment from his youth, meaning good family background too. Good believing family. And now he's seeking for eternal life. Anybody have daughters here? Wouldn't you want your daughter to get married to this kind of guy? (laughs) Very eligible bachelor here. He has all the money, all the everything the world is seeking, plus faith, and he's not going out partying, he's going seeking for eternal life. Wow. He's the one that everyone envies and looks up to. And on top of that, he is here right now with Jesus, asking him about eternal life, paying him respect by saying, good teacher. But Jesus responds by saying, why do you call me good? Don't you know that only God is good? And Jesus asks him, did you keep the commandments? He proudly says, Yes, I kept all of them since youth. Jesus says, you lack one thing. And he tells him to sell all his possessions and give it to the poor and follow him. See, Jesus is telling him, you need to follow me if you want eternal life. In order to do that, you have to take up your cross, and that wealth is your cross. But Jesus, but because he was extremely rich, He became very sad and left Jesus. He couldn't let go. Right after this, immediately after this incident, Jesus teaches his disciples about a camel. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. He says, how hard is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Luke 18, 24 and 25. Eye of a needle, you think about a needle and the little hole there. And, and I've, heard, I've preached before and I've heard uh, you know, other people say, 
how can a camel go through that hole? Anybody? Like a riddle. If you kill a camel, take his fur, whatever, hair, and make it into a thread, then you can. But the, uh, the eye of a needle, another interpretation is that it was a small side door to a, a city in, in the city wall that was used after the big city gate was closed at night times. When merchants come in late or, or shepherds come in late, they have to go through that small door, right? And in order for a camel to go through, first, you have to take off all the luggage from the camel's back. You have to force it to kneel down and crawl <laughs> through that small door and imagine how hard. Camels are stubborn beings. How hard for the master to pull or push and force the camel to go through that door. First, he needs to, he needs to take off, get rid of, empty himself of his, his luggage. In order for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven, that's the first thing we need to do. Our sins, our luggage, our greed. And then get on our knees, humbly, to enter in. So Jesus is not only speaking about physical and, and material wealth. And that's why in the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's no one in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible, where Jesus says it's easy to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's nowhere in the Bible. Every time Jesus makes it harder. <laughs> only, only Apostle Paul and the, the other writers speak about the grace after, only after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. It is that, that magic key for us, although it is so hard if we hold on to that faith and grace of Jesus. But Jesus never said it was, it's easy to go into the kingdom of heaven or to receive eternal life. So after saying this, Jesus comes to today's passage, prophesies about his suffering and death and resurrection. And then after that, he goes down to Jericho. He heals the blind, and then he comes to Jericho and meets Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. I'm not going to read the whole passage, trusting that you have heard and you know the story about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Not just tax collector, chief of tax collector. The kind of person that most Jews hated and despised. If there was anybody who, to go to heaven and become a burn, you know, burn in heaven, it's the tax collectors, they thought. They thought they were the first ones to be judged and cursed by God. And Zacchaeus knew his reputation. And therefore, he could not find the courage to even come before Jesus. He heard that Jesus was coming, and so he just watched from afar. But seeing that he even climbed a tree. Now, when we see these uh, Sunday school pictures, we see a little boy Zacchaeus climbing a nice tree, right? But think about this. He's a chief tax collector, the boss of the IRAS. How old do you think he was? Right? Can you imagine? You know, you go, somebody, a, a very important guest is coming. And our elders are very curious or very, you want to see him so much, but there are so many people that climb one of those trees. Can you imagine any of the elders climbing those trees? You'd be like, Elder, what are you doing? Come down. <laughs> Out of your mind? See, Zacchaeus did not care about his shame or reputation. It's not just about curiosity here. There must have been some kind of desperate need for him to meet or see Jesus. There must have been a reason, right? For this old man, or at least middle-aged man, 
to climb that tree to seek Jesus. And everybody probably thought, and he's a short guy, right? So everybody thought, probably thought, oh, that guy. But then Jesus passing by noticed him and he called him Zacchaeus. Who told him his name? I'm in the RRAS, you must be in the CIA, how do you know my name? No, he, Jesus knew his name, he said, I'm going to go to your home. I'm going to stay at your home tonight. Zacchaeus was overjoyed. He received him, and they went to their home, his home. What did Jesus notice? Throughout Jesus's, and I said this very many times, throughout Jesus's public ministry, he goes to different random places, and he takes notice of different people who are in need and people who have that seed of faith. Jesus went to Jericho, not for any other reason, but to find Zacchaeus. He went, to, he went there to find the lost. And did, according to the Bible, all three Gospels, all synoptic Gospels, that tell us about Zacchaeus' story, Jesus did not say anything. But Zacchaeus repented before Jesus, saying, Behold, Lord, Half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. This is in Luke chapter eight, 19, verse 8. What's he doing? After, do you think he defrauded some people? Yes. Yeah. Probably. So if he gives half of his possession to the poor and gives back four, gives back four times the defrauded money, how much does he have left? He probably goes minus. What's he doing? Jesus did not even tell him anything, but he is doing what Jesus told the young rich ruler to do. Were they cousins, family? Called him, hey, if, you, Jesus, if Jesus comes, he likes you to give up all your possessions. So if you really want him, do that. He didn't, he didn't know. right? This is a natural reaction of a sinner when he really meets Jesus. Zacchaeus did not seek for anything. Like the young rich ruler, he came for an, a, a question, something that he wanted. But for Zacchaeus, Jesus was what he wanted. Jesus was the answer for him. Somehow he was repenting before Jesus about his past. It's not the money he was laying out before Jesus. It was his sin he was laying out before Jesus. Saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. And what does Jesus say to him? Today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus is saying, Zacchaeus, this is the reason why I came to this world. Not only to Jericho, this is the reason why I came to this world. This, this is the difference between the one that has really met Jesus and another one that just had a chance but passed it. Zacchaeus was able to really meet Jesus and knew who Jesus was. And Jesus did not have to ask him about commandments, about whether he knows God. He, he, Jesus did not say, you sell all your possessions and give to the poor. What's the difference between the two people? Outwardly, it was definitely the young rich ruler who seemed to have much greater faith. And he would be the one that people thought would deserve to go to heaven. Zacchaeus, they thought he deserves to burn in hell. But the young rich ruler, he saw Jesus as just another good teacher that passes by. Even when Jesus gave him a hint, it is only God who is good. Why do you call me good? What was Jesus asking? 
Do you know that I am? Do you know who I am when you call me good? Do you really believe me? He also considered Jesus' teaching just as another teaching. To him, Jesus was nothing more than that. Jesus said, go sell your possessions and follow me. Give to the poor and follow me. This guy became sad or grieved, upset, or even offended, and he went away. He never came back. Meaning, he took that teaching and he said, oh, really? I don't agree with it. So what do you think he, he did? He went and lived, continued to live his life as he always did, keeping the commandments, keeping the commandments. The Bible doesn't say, we don't know, but one thing so clear is that he never came back to follow Jesus. Meaning, Jesus' teaching did not change his life. Is it because Jesus' teaching was not powerful enough? No, he didn't take it. Is the word not powerful enough for you? Is it changing your life? For Zacchaeus, just the presence of Jesus changed him around. So Zacchaeus was dire to meet Jesus. He was desperate. He even climbed the sycamore tree so that he would not miss this opportunity. It was not just one, uh, another teacher that passes by. It was not just one of the many opportunities. He, th- he believed this is the only chance in his life to repent, to come to him. He did not want to miss this opportunity. The young rich ruler had something he wanted. He came to see if Jesus can give it to him. Zacchaeus did not need anything. Jesus, as I said earlier, Jesus was the answer for him. The young rich ruler was satisfied and even proud of his own deeds, the ways of his own life, and believed that he had salvation because of them. But Zacchaeus was certain that he cannot receive salvation with his own deeds. And knew that he needed that grace, forgiveness. Which one are you today? Are you that young rich ruler? I lived a good life. Or are you Zacchaeus? The rich ruler could not empty himself of his possessions and deeds. He could not empty his heart of his pride and arrogance and his own righteousness. He only wanted to know about eternal life for the head. Are we here for more knowledge of the Bible? um, That knowledge of the Bible, unless it becomes spirit, unless it leads us to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, unless it leads us to really real personal relationship with God, if it remains as knowledge, that can become poison. He wanted that knowledge, that know-how, that information about eternal life. But Zacchaeus was desperate for life. Is meeting Jesus that important to you? Meeting Jesus. Or is it just another thing? Is worship service that important to you? Or just because it comes around every week, it's another thing? Taking up the cross is what Zacchaeus did giving up all that was Zacchaeus' way of taking up the cross. For Jesus, taking up the cross was leaving the throne of the kingdom of heaven to come down down here to this earth to be misunderstood, mistreated, persecuted, beaten, lashed, and killed without any sin. You and I, I'm not saying here 
that you should give up everything, that you should sell everything you have. But we need to look into our hearts. How important is following Jesus in our life? How important is it? We cannot give up everything on our own. But imagine if you have children, for example, okay, if they get kidnapped and they, the kidnapper asks for ransom, what parent would not sell everything just to save that life? Right? right. What person would not give up everything just to save his or her own life? Is salvation less than that? So do you need that cross once again? What would you do in order that you can make sure that you are in the kingdom of heaven? What is it that stops me from following Jesus today? As conclusion, we are in time of Lent right now. Almost over. But let us take this opportunity to, to think about the importance of the cross in our life, in your life. Bearing the cross is a natural result of really meeting Jesus. The question I want to ask today, I want us to ask ourselves, have I really met Jesus? Or am I going through the motions? Is Christianity just a religion for me that I tick in my applications? Is it just my, my thing or identity? I group myself with the Christians? Or is it really a path of life? Is it really a relationship that I have with God? There will have to be more people like Zacchaeus today than the young rich ruler. May you and I be like Zacchaeus in seeking and treasuring the meeting with Jesus. The cross is the only way for us to have that real, real relationship to follow Jesus. It is not an option. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to take up that, your cross. But when we really see how important this salvation is, when we really see how important this cross is, you know what? We would be asking the Lord, Lord, I need that cross. That cross is not your husband. The cross is not your children. The cross is the life that you're living after meeting Jesus. And I believe that most of you, we are walking the path of cross. I'm not telling you that you are not walking the path of cross. It might, it might sound different, but I'm trying to comfort you today that walking the path of cross, although it's hard and you are doing it, and that's what Jesus approves. Jesus says, you are following me today. As the last point, let us think about Peter as conclusion. Jesus gave the parable about the camel. And this is what Peter, you know, the par par camel and the eye of the needle. And immediately after that, this is what Peter says. Behold, we have left our homes and followed you. True or false? True. Peter is one of the most respected disciples. We always think when we say Peter, you think, what do you think? Three times denial, right? But Peter, we have to give him some credit. He was the most zealous all the time. He was the, the one who is awake. All the other disciples were falling asleep. He's the one awake giving the answers, right? And he, right before he denied Jesus, who was at the closest proximity, who was at the closest place to Jesus during the trial? It was Peter. Peter tried his best to keep his promise with Jesus. I will be there. But then, because of hu his human weakness, he had to deny Jesus. Just imagine his zeal and fervency, his love for Jesus, but he denied Jesus and how disappointed he must have been with his own self. How sad, how depressed he must have been. But Jesus rises again and he gives him hope. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, this time, is very honest. 
Jesus, I don't agape or love you. I feel or love you. I cannot. I know I cannot. I don't have the ability. Jesus is saying, but I love you. So you tend my sheep. From that point, Peter lived a life of the cross all the way until he was crucified upside down. He said, my Lord was crucified right side up. How can I do the same thing? Crucify me upside down. Again, I'd like to ask you, have you met the Lord? Have you met our Father in heaven? And did that change your life? If it did, the life you're living is the life of the cross. We might, we might make mistakes. We might go away, go astray for a little bit. But those who have committed to the life of the cross, He will guide you. He will make sure that you are there on Mount Zion in the end. He will bring you back and your children. So let us give ourselves, let us really think about, have I really met Jesus and have I given up? Have I emptied myself like Zacchaeus? And I pray that Jesus will tell you, today salvation has come to your house. Amen. And he, I pray that he will say, you are also Abraham's children. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, the cross, and for salvation. Father, if it weren't for Jesus, if it weren't for you who came, if it weren't for that time when we met you, Father, our life we don't even want to imagine. But because you came to meet us, we are here today. We are still here, Father, even though things are hard, because we want to continue to follow you. Father, this cross is heavy. This cross is hard. But we bear it because we believe this is what will lead us to eternal life. Father, help us to have that hope and help us to continue to walk with you. Help us, Father. Thank you so much for your grace. And in Jesus' name we prayed. Amen. Let's give thanks to God. Amen.